All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Ask Me Anything about Enabling Business Intelligence. We have the best team here with Don, Laura, and Christian, who are some of our like, best experts around this topic. And you'll definitely want to take advantage of having them be here and get your questions in for them. So as a way of introduction, I guess I'll go first, seeing as I don't actually have a name. I'm Stephanie. I run our webinar program here, and I'm going to be helping create the webinar. And part of that is going to be bringing you guys on live if you would like to come on live. And let me just show you how you can do that. All right, so I'm going to leave this here. You guys can give it a read as we go around to introduce ourselves. But basically, we're going to be using that hand raise option if anyone wants to come on live. And so, Don, for your introduction, I want everyone to answer the question here of what show are you currently watching or are excited to watch? <laughs> okay, hi, hi there, everybody. I'm Don Murray, one of the founders. And um, okay, the show I'm really excited about that I'm watching now is Mar of uh, East Town. So uh, really great. It's got Kate Winslet in it. Really good. Uh, and the show I'm really looking forward to is uh, Loki. Uh, which is the Marvel Universe, and I think that starts June 6th, so to totally different types of show, yeah. <laughs> Good show. No, I'm excited for those. Cool. All right, Laura, what about you? Huh. Hi, so my name is Laura. I am one of the team leads for our FME server support team here at SAFE. Uh, as for a show, um, yeah, I'm currently working through WandaVision, actually, on the same kind of Marvel theme, so that's been interesting. But, nice. Yeah. Uh, Lots of Marvel happening. Chris, are you going to keep the train going? <laughs> yeah, I think I will. So yeah, I'm Chris. I'm an FME technology expert on the desktop side here at SAFE. And my brother actually recently just added me to his Disney Plus. So we've been on a huge kick with that. So I, yeah, we found this been going through old movies and things like Recess and Weekenders. So it's going living a blast with the past. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. So audience here, raise your hand if you too are watching a Marvel show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hands are coming up right now. Oh, here we go. They're flying in. I was watching the Friends reunion, so um, but that's only because I finished our, all the Marvel ones. Okay, <laughs> we're at about like five percent of people watching Marvel, so maybe we encourage people to go out today. Yeah, cool. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> all right, but let's dive into business intelligence. What people are here for today? Um, I'll remind everyone to get your questions in, either type them in or raise your hand. And let's go with the first question. So what are some use cases where you see spatial data being used in a business uh, context? Okay. Maybe each of you kind of pick one. Sure, I'll, okay, I'll go first. And um, so one of the exciting areas is um, um, insurance companies. So they're, um, so for example, we have a, a, an insurance um, reseller in, um, or broker in the Florida region, that whole region of the United States. And so they really watch, you know, storms and weather patterns, and um, they use that to decide premiums, deductibles. But also, when a huge storm is coming in, what insurance companies do is they will they will re rebalance their portfolios to uh, ensure that not one particular company is hit harder than others. And so that's a really exciting um, place for spatial data and with climate change and the way that things are changing and the severity of the storms, this is really a, a growing, a growing area around any sort of weather event. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. I just, yeah, I think one that I encountered somewhat recently was in agriculture actually. So it was um, keeping track of different fields where different crops were growing. Um, and they were looking at the different types of pests and things that they were dealing with in those and the kinds of pesticides and things that they were using in those uh, fields. So they wanted to keep track of, kind of what was happening kind of overall spatially, where everything, where all the pests were located, which kind of concentrations of different types were there and what kind of mitigation um, options they were trying to do for those. So that was an interesting one. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then on my side, I've seen a couple couple of neat ones for mining specifically, um, and they were actually looking at the, the drill lines and comparing it with, uh, it was like the the gases in the layers of the earth to make sure there weren't any breakouts or outbursts, sorry, and yeah, it was very interesting stuff. Way over my head because I'm not in mining at all, but 
very cool to see. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll have to add one from a marketing perspective, which could also be for retail as well, that understanding where your customers are and using location for that purpose, either if you're deciding where to pick a store, which we've seen people do, or figuring out even for webinars, we're like, we can pick webinar times based on where our audience is from. So that is a huge value as well. Um, yeah. Don, do any others come to mind? No, I, I mean, that's an exciting one too. And even um, in airports, you know, like indoor mapping, we know that airports track flows to figure out where to put stores and to try to spread crowds out because retail in airports is actually a significant source of revenue. And, and um, they want to make sure that there's not huge crowds because that stresses people out. So they like to spread things out. And, um, and um, so that goes to the retail, but also just watching the, uh, the traffic flow is another great use of spatial data. Yeah. Totally. Um, I'll say to the audience as well, if you have anything you want to add to that, please type it in. If you're working in business intelligence in a particular space, let us know because, and we'll let the audience know as well, because it's interesting knowledge for everyone to have. We want this to be not just a Q&A session. It can be a conversation as well. So if you want to raise your hand just to come on the air and give uh, your opinion, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, okay, next question. So what are some of the BI dashboards that SAFE has supported? Do you want to do that one, Laura? You've seen, what have you seen? Yeah, so I was just thinking of the tools, I guess. Um, so mm. things like Tableau, um, Power BI, Click, those are all the biggest ones that I've seen. Um, yeah. 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 We've definitely done a webinar on Click. <laughs> Trying yeah. to think of some of the memories I've had. I think we've done a webinar on Tableau as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. And some of those um, BI tools like Tableau, they do have some support for spatial data in the sense that they they can display um, lat latitude and longitude points. And so, you know, and one of the things with FME, of course, is making sure that when the data is is sent to these BI platforms that it is in a projection or the coordinates or something that it that the tableau can can render and, and show in context on a map so that's um, um you know one of the big things and spatial data like any data quality is important and so with fme um and our data integration platform it's easy to ensure that you know, if you're looking, you know, in a particular state, if there's if there's coordinates that for some reason are at zero zero, zero zero seems to be a popular default in some systems, you can easily um, just weed those out and um, and make sure that the the data that's going to your dashboard is quality and also make sure required fields are there. So there's lots of ways that you can you know, improve the 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 dashboard, you know, whatever it is. And so yeah. Totally. Okay, we got a couple hands raised, so let's give it a try. It's always a bit of a gamble when we're working with. That's right. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, it looks like Canner. I'm gonna go ahead and make you a panelist here, and we'll send you an option to unmute. Um, on that, we did have a question regarding like insurance and whether or not we have any examples of how FME. Uh, has helped in the insurance. Well, okay, so let's get to that after. It looks like Canna has been okay. able to come online. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, I'm from Canada, uh, Niagara Falls. I'm working with GHT. Just a quick summary about me. And um, I'm just curious about uh, if there's any plans for the predictive models, for example, linear regression, logistic regression, or decision tree, all this kind of predictive models. Is there any, are you guys planning to make tools for this kind of things. I'm using mm -hmm. FME for literally everything. I, yeah. I, I used to uh, play with Python for uh, data and then FME started to become much, much, much easier and uh, I can do everything much faster in FME. So I'm trying to transfer all my skills into FME and if we can utilize this uh, pro predictive models in uh, especially business analysis, it will be amazing. So mm -hmm. I, I was just curious, what what is your plan for this direction. Yeah, though 
That is an amazingly good good question. And honestly, um, at this point, the answer is no. I mean, I'm not going to. Um, but there are our strategy with many of these, if there's web services that do predictive models, like through a cloud vendor or there's a Python library, we would engage that. So for our AI and, um, and machine learning, our strategy has been to build connectors to the big, the big um, cloud vendors like Google, like Amazon, like um, Microsoft and do that. But we would love to follow up with you and, and, um, and if there's Python libraries that you've been using in the past or there's systems that you, you're using um, and also to understand what the kind of data you're working with, that would be be really great. Because that's one of the benefits of these Ask Me Any things as well is mm -hmm. um, it's like a trade show. And at a trade show, you know, we'll we'll be at a trade show booth and people come up and ask us and share information with us. And so and that's one of the huge values of a trade show is also getting information on what people want us to add to FME. So so thanks for uh, that. Any Anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm Laura Christian, have you seen? Yeah, I know that questions come up off and on for sure in this context in particular. Yeah. So it's definitely yeah. a good one. So something we can absolutely. So we will follow up with you. And yeah. um yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't if you haven't seen the blue dot story too, that also might be relevant because that's similar to what they're doing in their story as well. They're using FME to do all the cleanup before they push it into their AI. So that might help be a pathway for you. Yeah. Uh, what was that again? Can you repeat it again? I'll I'll send out the link in the chat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. That was a webinar we did with a company called Blue Dot, and it was more of an interview. So, so that's a great idea, Christian. It's a good uh, yeah. example. I think it'll be really yeah. interesting. But we love hearing that you've been trying to use FME for everything and are pushing the limits that way. So yeah. that's a fantastic question. Yeah, and we do have customers who are using FME with um, AI and ML tools to to basically, if they have huge sums of data that comes in regularly in a grid, but then periodically some of the data values are missing and then using historic information and values around it to sort of fill in empty, empty values. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting one, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, currently, for example, uh, we are separating the data because of some people are, are working on Python, some people are using R, some people are using Alterx, and with FME, I can glue everything together. Yes. And that was the reason that I, I wanted to um, ask you guys. And for example, Alterx is very similar application to FME, but it's more uh, business intelligence oriented. I like FME more. I don't like Alterx. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, FME is much easier. I don't know. The interface yeah. looks better. And, it's just you can pick up everything much faster. So mm -hmm. I'm really big fan of it, and uh, I would like to utilize things. So I was yeah. trying to convert the R scripts that we have, but it's also like you have to bring them in. If there will be some built-in tools, it will be much easier for me. That's why I specifically wanted to ask about it. Yeah, and we, and we view FME as an integration platform, not in the sense that we just integrate data, but also the platform to integrate all these capabilities. And so that's why, we're really curious in what libraries you're using now. And that's why we built in an R caller. So if you, you know, some some users have amazing um, things they're doing in R. So rather than try to re replicate all that, we basically try to make it easy to call out to R or Python. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so yeah, we'll definitely, I'm looking forward to that discussion. Yeah, yeah cool. we'll follow up for sure. But thank yeah. you so much for yeah, you, coming online to chat with us. I mm -hmm. think okay, I might just have to, Oh, perfect. He's got it covered. Um, okay, I do see a couple more hand raised, but before we get to those, uh, let's just answer a couple questions that came in behind the scenes here. So sure, sure. it looks like we have a couple people who are interested in using um, FME maybe in the insurance space and are looking for some examples or if any equivalent ones come to mind. Yeah, so there are, I think if we do a search on our, what we can do again is we can look on our customer success stories or case stories. I know they've, um, at World Tours, there have been some some that have been presented. Um, Guy Carpenter, for example, presented one. And um, there's, so we'll have to, we'll, we'll dig those up. There are definitely examples of how companies are using our technology. So, um, yeah. yeah um, it looks like I found one here. So I'm just gonna, I'll chat out this link to where all our customer stories are. And if you type in your keyword like insurance, a story comes up or multiple. So yeah. okay. definitely, 
yeah. <laughs> yeah, because one, that's one of the things that we really put a lot of effort into. And and for you know for sure some customers they can't talk, tell us the, their story because they view it as a um, an advantage in the um, in the competitive market. But um, but it's really great because nobody wants to be first, and and it's really nice when somebody else you see what somebody else is doing with F and and um, yeah. So we make a big effort to get those. So. Yeah, so I would say if you go out and try FME for the insurance space, report back. We'd love to hear your story on how it went. Yeah, and if you're starting with FME, really reach out. We talk at SAFE about the restaurant model, which means that we really strive to give really good support. And particularly when you're starting out, that's when, you know, you've got this, this learning curve in front of you. And so, you know, folks like Christian and Laura, and there's a huge team um, that they they represent this morning and um, that are just they just love helping helping you and and they can just save you so much time with examples or hey here's an approach that that others have had success with rather than you know then kind of start with a blank canvas and go from scratch yeah okay so on that um, we maybe yeah could bring some of the newer folks up to speed here there was a question that said what do you mean by connectors. Sure. Who wants to take that one? That's a that's a good one. That is a good one. I was actually just typing for a response to that one. Um, in terms of connectors, um, I don't know about the the absolute technical side, but we're pretty much relying on the API of the service for that. So one example would be the Salesforce connector or the Box connector or things like that, where we don't build the service, but they have an API that we can connect to. So we've wrapped up a transformer that can simply just connect to those services. So we'll be pushing the data up, downloading it, or uh, getting a list returned back, things like that. Yeah. yeah, and there's hundreds of them to different systems. So when we talk about you know a connector, it means we're connecting to some system, like those AI machine learning ones. If you want to do something with them, there's a connector in FME, and you just use that to uh, to connect out. There's an S3, you know, connector for example that enables you to push data to S3, download data to S3, look at what's on S3, share data on S3, all sorts of things like that. So there's just um, anything with a Rest or soap API. There you go. Yeah. Nice. Good yeah. question, though. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and try and bring on uh, Saravan online. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but I'm going to go ahead and make you a panelist and I'll send you a prompt to share your microphone and webcam. Hang on here. If it doesn't work, it looks like maybe they typed their question in anyway, but. Uh, and unmute request. And okay, I'm not sure if this is going to play today. Okay, I think they typed in their question anyway, so we'll go okay. with that. There's a good one there that I'm about right back on connectors while we're waiting. And it was, is there a connector for AI ML from imagery analysis? And the answer is absolutely yes. There's um, connectors for the for imagery analysis on AWS and Google and um, Amazon. There's also, um, sorry, and uh, Microsoft, AWS and Amazon are the same thing. Um, and um, yeah, and there's also some built-in capabilities right within FME for, for some imagery analysis. And one of the big things that MS, you know, we haven't talked about it, but FME does vector data and raster data, you know, point cloud data, um, yeah, 3D building data. So lots of different data types. So the answer for that one is absolutely. And um, yeah, and again, reach out to us if you want to know how to use it, or you have any questions on it, or you want to do, you want us to extend it. Um, FME is never done. Yeah. So I think uh, Sarah Van's question was to do with being in the telecom space, and was again wondering if we have any examples. So that might be directing you again to the safe.com/customers, unless anything else comes to mind. Yeah. Okay, next question we got is, um, how has location data influenced BI platforms in the last few years? Sure, that's a good question. Yeah, it's really, from where, from, our, from Safe's perspective, it's pretty exciting to see what's going on in the, um, in the whole BI and business space. We're seeing the importance of spatial data increase, and this is um, route, um, easy to see because we're seeing the databases that traditionally haven't supported spatial or location data now adding it. So we're seeing Google BigQuery, we're seeing Amazon add it to a lot of their 
um, data warehouse offerings. And we're also seeing Snowflake, um, who recently added spatial data capabilities to, to their databases. And the reason they're doing this is um, because they have demand from their users who want to start doing more and leveraging um, spatial data. Um, you know, everything happens somewhere. Everybody is always someplace and everything is someplace. And with 5G coming online and, um, you know, people wanting to serve their customers better or even just identify, you know, where their customers are and things like that, you can really start to um, you know, really start to understand when you can look at things. And if you ever buy a coffee table book and you want, you want to make sure it's one that people look at just get a nice book of maps everybody loves maps and um and um, we like to know where we are we like to look at you know the, the planet and, and and understand things and being able to do that in a spatial context just really really helps understand and make better decisions so yeah totally we used to have really beautiful map pictures in the old safe office do you remember those yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah sure absolutely good. yeah um Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and try and bring John online, but while I do that, let me just check if there were any quick questions that come to mind. Um, is FME able to connect data from di different systems to get it to view, to get it a view of data that is combined or joined? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, we, uh, FME has connectors or readers and uh, readers, what we'd call readers that connect to the data sets. We've got about 450 of those at this point and counting and then lots of other options for connecting to other types of data sets. So yeah, pretty much you name it, we can probably connect to that in some way um, if it's directly to whatever that data set is or through an API call to the data, we can pull those in and work with them. Um, once the data is in FME, we can work with it as if it's all kind of in a single system, because it will be at that point. So you can join them, uh, do queries, do whatever you need to kind of manipulate that and get it into a form that makes sense for what you're doing. How many different systems could I connect to at once, Laura? Is there a limit? Like, is it five or something? <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's as many as you can fit, I guess, as many you can access. <laughs> I feel like Don's tested this. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a, so Don, what's the magic number? Yeah, but it is a huge value of FME, and that's why I sort of threw that out there. Is often you do need to pull data from multiple systems at once, and then make it look like it came from one system. So, yeah. What about? There's a great question there too, Steph, about dirty data. So, Christian, what did, you know, can FME help you with dirty data and formatting and? Absolutely. Yeah. Anything in, term, in terms of formatting numbers, dates, uh, doing some string concatenations, or even validating if you're expecting certain values, uh, whether that be on the uh, data type itself or if it's on the actual value, you can do all the, all sorts of things with that. Um, and that's one of the key advantages with um, at using FME to prepare your data for a BI, is it's always going to have to go through those standard procedures to make sure it does meet the requirements before it's posted up to your BI tool. Yeah. So you can confidently um, have that written up to your system and know that all the values are exactly what they should be. And for all the ones that don't meet them too, you're not just lost. Like you don't, you don't have to just say, okay, I don't have them anymore. You can do stuff with them in the workspace as well. So if it doesn't quite match up your required to your required schema or your standard, um, you can have FME either try to try to re repair those values and with the expected ones, or you could write it out to a summary report so you could go back and look at them and repair them manually or not manually, but in a second workspace. So. Right. Okay, I'm going to try one more time here with John, see if we can get him online with us. But sometimes GoTo has some funny little things that your computer doesn't always allow for. So yeah. sorry, John, you might have to type your question into us instead. Okay. So. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Uh, so how about location of customers? Can FME convert an address to a location, geocode? Um, if so, what geocoder? And can I use a different one if I have to, or if I have one? The answer yeah. is yes. <laughs> yeah, we have a ton of different geocoding services. Um, yeah, I would say that there is that one main one called with the geocoder transformer. And inside of that, we have several services um, obviously, the main ones like Google, ArcGIS Online, just do a quick scroll through um, here and things like OpenStreetMaps as well. There's a couple of free ones. Other ones require either a license or an API key. 
Um, and on top of that, I believe there's a few geocoders that are on the FME Hub as well. So that's a little bit of a good lead into the FME Hub if you're not aware of it already. That's a place, it's basically a marketplace where users, partners, and safers can all upload their own custom transformers. Those could be connectors, they could be formats, um, and even template workspaces as well. Mm -hmm. All those are available to download and use in your workspace. Fantastic. Okay, we got so many questions coming. Hang on, let's see. Um, is there any connector available for bark for, for bulk downloading files from ProjectWise where files are located in multiple locations on ProjectWise? That's a good question. We do have a ProjectWise connector. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the bulk aspect yeah, of that, though. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I see. Yeah, there's the project-wise file downloader. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just download that and see if there's a bulk option built in there. Yes. <laughs> Good work, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So we will get back to you. <laughs> yeah, I I don't see an option for bulk, but I also don't know what I like. They're using API version 1.3, so I don't know if that's built into the API already. Um, we could potentially dive into the transformer because that's again that's a hub transformer. Um, so it's built on the FME Hub where you can download it and you can actually kind of edit it as well if you want to go and look and see what's happening inside of there. So um, I don't see any indication that it is using any bulk off functionality though. Yeah. So. There is one called the ProjectWise WSG connector as well, which is a built-in transformer. Actually, I don't know if that's a built-in or a hub transformer. I have it downloaded. So, <laughs> But that one has a list option. So you could actually go in and list all the files in your ProjectWise kind of account or server i'm not exactly i don't know too much about project wise and the terminology there but mm -hmm. you could theoretically list out all the files that are in there and then you could hook up a second project wise connector to then download the files from the listed locations so that could work as a bulk option so it would go through and kind of look through all the files that you want uh, get a list of those and filter out the ones that you care about and then download just those ones mm -hmm. oh there's a good railway question there and that speaks near to my heart <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So that one's um, somebody's working with a railway transit client and helping them manage assets. They're looking to, for a use case and a product demo. So um, yeah. So absolutely, we have many railway companies that are using FME. Um, some of them are using our real-time capabilities to actually track the location um, and other information about their locomotives. And um, because that's again, we haven't talked about that, but FME does real-time and you know transactional or connecting applications um, in real time, but also high speed data streaming. And that's what they're using. We also have, um, you know, some transit companies that are using it. We support the transit format. What is that? Does anybody remember what that general, generic transit? Anyway, there was a, anyway, there, do you remember Christian what that one is? There's a, some transit format. Probably if we type transit, it'll come up. GTFS, something. Yeah, GTFS. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, yeah, and, um, and so, so yeah, you totally can manage assets. We have utility companies um, that are also using their um, FME to transit. We have snow plows in what state uses FME to track all their snow plows? Is that Iowa? Iowa, yeah, somewhere that gets lots of snow. So again, you know, if you're new to FME, reach out to us and we can we can share demos with you. We can share use cases and we can you know walk you through, get you started on 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 how to how to do that. So uh, yeah. yeah. So that's a good question, John. Where, good question. Yeah. But thank you so much for sharing the information. So we'll be sharing that email or? Yeah, that was going to be my question, John. Where should people reach out? How is... ah, they can, yeah. So there's the community, which is a good spot, or there's live chat on the bottom corner of our website. And and you're talking to a real person there if you go there. And, and the nice thing there is it's manned by... Um, you know, by a person like Laura or Christian, like really high tech person. And uh, and if they don't, if they're not the expert in a particular area, they will connect you to the person at safe. So it's live chat or support at safe.com, I believe also works. Um, yeah, so that's. Um, and Don, uh, do we have any existing relationship with Accenture? Like uh, Accenture is using the product for the client? Oh, sorry, would you mind repeating that? I'm saying, uh, do we have any existing relationship with my company Accenture and FME between? Accenture? Ah, yes. um, not not at a formal level. So we know that Accenture in some places has done work with FME. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but we'd definitely be interested in following up and learning what you're working on and how we can work with you. Yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you. And that's another thing that that that's a, that question, you know, um, comes to mind. If anybody wants to try FME, our real our strategy really is um, just download it and try it. We'll give you free evaluation licenses, whether it be server or desktop, help you, you know, get some success, see some value, and, and then and then you purchase it. The real really is, um, you know, you buy FME when it goes into production, not when you're doing testing or pilots or just trying to understand is this technology is for you. So. Um, and that works well if you're trying to build a prototype to show others in your company the value, and then um, you have the whole um, FME platform at your disposal, and you don't have to worry about about justifying costs for for something when you're just in the early incubation stage. Yeah. Understood. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming online with us. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, okay. So this. Oh, this one looks like kind of a long question. Right down here. Okay, are there any plans to provide a database connection for Small World? Undergoing an ETL environment migration and currently migrating over 300 objects and tables, so a lot of workbenches with no database connection that can be changed once is causing a pain point as each Small World reader in each workbench has to be manually changed. Any advice? That was kind of a long one that you guys might want to read out. <laughs> or yeah. so we, do, we do have a small world. So they're, use, they're using the small world reader writer that um, that's provided by a third party. Is that right, Laura? Yeah, I, I believe so. I, I don't actually know too much. Oh, Chris. Yeah. That's, yeah, is that the SBS plugin that you're thinking of? Yeah. I think that the spatial biz. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, spatial business systems, they produce a, um, a third party connector to small world, and that would be um and it enables you to read and write from small world so um that's the approach that you would use um for that and again we can re reach out to us and we can hook you up with our resident small world um, um expert and um and get you connected to the folks at uh, at sbs small world is a different um animal it takes um and so there's a third party that really understands the small world database and has spent their business really is connecting to small world so yeah apparently we have two versions of that reader actually so there yeah there is the sbs one uh that's yeah. the reader and writer and that's available in 32 or 64 bit it, it requires that spatial biz license uh, yeah. from spatial biz and then there's also this just a small world reader and writer in fme as well um i believe that's only 32 bit though i might be incorrect about that though okay I will send that link out in your in the response. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chris. Okay, let's go with some more questions here. Um, so much use of BI platforms now is to reveal intelligence on what's happening right now. So based on like live streaming data. And does FME do anything to support this? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh Don, you can go. Oh, go ahead. Go <laughs> oh, ahead. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. jumping at the gun for this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good one. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we have a, a good number of connectors right now that can connect to various types of live stream data. So anything from like a web hook or web socket to what are some other examples of like, um, Kafka? You know, Kafka is yeah. another example. Yeah, yeah. And then there's lots of others. Um, any um, real-time data feed from one of the big IoT um, platform, whether it be AWS, Google, or um, Azure. Again, we can connect to those. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about FME is it's the same platform. So if you were, um, you know, you built a workflow that was not real time but then all of a sudden you had access to the real time data you wouldn't you wouldn't need to do that many changes to your your workspace your workspace um because the you're still using workbench and all the same stuff so there's not a, not a big relearning there so yeah do you think that this real time processing is going to change the bi space in any way yeah i think so i think um there's because what real time does is it enables you to see what's going on right now, right? And um, and that's always valuable 
when you're in, you know, retail, for example, maybe you're selling, you know, some goods that have to be cleared out by the end of the day. So it's good to know where they are if you can add special prices or you can connect it to your order entry. Um, also in situational awareness, we talked about, um, you know, um, disasters and events. Um, you know, there's a lot of forest fires right now. We have many customers using them for that. And those situations can change really, really quickly. So the, the quicker the data is coming in and being processed, the better the um, the better the, the reaction. There's also but there's still a need for historical information, like looking at you know longer term trends. And so and so that's still going to become still will be important. But I think the exciting thing about real time is now you can see and uh, make decisions based on what's happening um, in the ground. And, I guess a, probably the best example I would say. Well, there's always an ex, there's always a lot of good examples. So in situational awareness, it would be the winds change. You're fighting something, so you need to know. Okay, where are my people? I got to get them out. Um, in finance, a real time one, you could have all the data streaming through from from ATMs or following financial transactions. And if Christian, you know, goes and buys us coffee at Starbucks in Vancouver, and then you know, um, three minutes later he buys a uh, you know, a coffee in Florida or buy something in Florida, then right away that's probably fraud because it's, unless Christian has some amazing technology he hasn't told anybody about, there's no way for him physically to get from Vancouver to Florida. He's a better shape up because I don't even drink coffee. So they detect well, that way faster. <laughs> so they probably know that too. And so that if Christian bought the coffee in Vancouver, they would probably flag him right away. And that's an example of, you know, real time business intelligence, right? Um, and so some people say, oh, it's all going to become real time. And it's no, 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 it's not all going to become real time. You can do different things with real time versus looking at looking at trends, right? If you're looking at just things as they happen in real time, you can't you can't see the trend. You can just see what's going on now. So yeah, and FME does it all. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think that you covered another question that came in as well, which was someone asking like, what would some example data sources be for some of these real-time bi platforms but you mentioned like the fire example um yeah. and there's, there's, yeah. yeah yeah so yeah. that's great yeah and on the technology side there's kafka there's rabbit mq there's mqtt or is it mqqt sometimes it's one of those two i can't remember off the top of my head right now laura will straighten me out there um yeah, and then there's just lots of other um, popular connectors because when we built our real time, we recognized the first thing we need to do is make sure we connect to all the popular um, real time data feeds. And we're excited with IoT coming out and 5G. Um, already, we're we're starting to see customers more interested in what, you know how that's going to change things. So yeah. Great. Cool. Okay. Um, what is the difference between the Salesforce connector and the Salesforce read only under managed web services? Technical one. <laughs> yeah. So I guess one thing, the Salesforce read only one is read only. So it's only for reading in data. Um, easy answer. Um, it's also, yeah, that one's considered like a full on reader. So I think with that one, when you set it up, you can connect to Salesforce kind of like it was a database. You can kind of see all the different pieces in there and list out the data structure and, and kind of read in the data, you know, read in all the um, the accounts or users or something that like that in there. Um, all the connector is a little bit, I guess it's a bit more advanced, but you can go with kind of inputting and outputting data and it gives you the ability to write SQL SOQL statements like they're kind of SQL type language so you can do more advanced kind of queries and and work with the Salesforce uh, data itself mm -hmm. it? yeah we'll find out I think <laughs> good job Laura how's that worked <laughs> if not the user can get back to us there but um wow well, I learned something there thanks Laura that's awesome See, Laura's the best. Laura, oh, yeah, I learn something every, best. Every, every day. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a big, it's a big thing. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, my BI platform only takes ge geographic coordinates like lat and long. What should I do? Sounds like someone is stuck, maybe getting their uh, data to match the BI requirements. Hmm. Any way we can help them, Christian, or are they? Yeah, you could definitely use FME to, well, first off, if the if your features are already 
uh, built as vector geometry, all you would have to do would be to reproject it to a lot long coordinate system. I believe the, if you're working with something like Snowflake, the writer will put it up in the correct uh, geographic coordinates as long as it's in the correct coordinate system. So I'd imagine the other tools work similarly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if you're working one that with uh, with one that doesn't and you need to even extract the geometry, um, the geographic coordinates rather, you could use what we call a geometry extractor. And then let me just double check there. And then you have the option to write it out to a, an attribute, whether that's JSON, KML, or GeoJSON, or, something like, or XML as well, it leaves an option, or well-known text too. So there's lots of options if you need to write it out to a different system. Yeah, 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 that's a great question because the world is roundish and uh, maps, uh, maps are really flattish. And so there's no way to represent something round and something flat without distortion. And so I mean, it could be that you want to even calculate areas or you want to measure distances and the coordinates come out of your database like Snowflake and lat long coordinates. And so then you can't do area calculations and distance calculations using lat long coordinates. You just can't. Um, and so and so often you you'll reproject those into like a state plane or something else to that's um, in the area to get better, better. Um, better um, values and a lot some of the transformers in FME will do that under the covers because they'll if the coordinates are tagged but yeah it's a good question mm -hmm. okay and then what are some things to remember before bringing data into a BI platform uh, say like Tableau mm -hmm. that's a good one yeah I guess there's lots of factors depending on what your data looks like before it comes in mm -hmm. um, so often you can't really count on your data being necessarily perfect. So at data validation is a huge one, just kind of running a check to make sure, you know, each of the column types matches what you would expect and the data values are within a reasonable range and things like that. Anything mm -hmm. else anyone else has? Yeah, I would um, say this that validation piece would be the, the key yeah. thing, making sure everything is exactly how you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And data yeah. structure too, I think, with some of the tools, depending on how they work, when you create your visualization, if you want it to be, say, interactive or something like that, where you can click on, you know, a column in a bar chart and mm -hmm. dive down and drill into the data set, you need to make sure it's structured well so that you can do that more easily. So in that case, like you want to make sure that you have the right kind of columns and IDs kind of linking the different pieces of data together so you can make that work as well. So yeah, another good one FME can help with. Yeah, and of course, um, Laura touched on it earlier. You could bring data from multiple data sources and then push to your thing. And also, you can you can thin data out, in the sense you might not want you know might be reading a database with 50 columns, but for your BI, you you want like you know 10. And so with FME, you can do all sorts of things like that to uh, um, you know make sure that your BI tool is only looking at the data that you want to. And uh, yeah, the quality is the biggest one. And we have, um, and Laura touched on that, and we'll both Laura and Christian, and, and that is by far the biggest one, I think. Um, and there's tools in FME that really help you with data quality, whether it be, you know, you know geometry, spatial data quality, or just um, data quality in general of attribution. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay, so this one's kind of long. <laughs> I'm going to try and find a way to paraphrase it. Let's see. Um, so we found that BI data varies widely in spatial accuracy for telecommunication use. We spend a lot of money to purchase accurate data and then spend time to sort, filter, and make the data accurate to a minimum of, yeah, they spend money making the data accurate to a minimum. Um, it's time consuming, difficult to set up on the front end for each BI data source. What is what are they asking here? Hang on here. So I'm trying to find the question in it. Um, maybe oh maybe this was just not a question and more a statement. I think there's a follow up for that one. Yeah, no, um, I think I think it's just describing the the challenge. So they have yeah. lots, they have millions or thousands of these points, and they want to um, figure out how to get them to the center of the rooftop centroids, and um, because that's what they use for their data routing, and so. So certainly FME has the ability, like if you had a bunch of points and then you had rooftops, FME can find the closest point to the rooftop and then move it to 
the centroid of the roof if you if you need you you know you needed to do something like that or if you had the parcel polygons and then you had the building polygons you could match the buildings to the parcels and then figure out a centroid of the roof and calculate that so um, but yeah data accuracy um, and that goes back to the the, um, the data quality thing that Laura and Christian touched on sometimes the data the lot long data you know, in spatial data, the, the, the quality of the data doesn't just mean that they're valid lat long points. It, it means like what did, when the data was collected, what was it collected for? And is that purpose that it was collected for also relevant for, for your, you know, if you're, you know, a farmer and you just want to know, you know, have a point in every field. Well, that's, you know, that's met the requirement. But if you want, you know, that point to represent something else, then, um, and um and so yeah so they purchase accurate data as sorting filtering make the data accurate to a minimum of parcel centroid yep so we can calculate and if you had a bunch of data you purchased we could find out the data that's at, um, closest for a parcel and move the point to the centroid of a parcel and if you also had the buildings we could then move it to the center of the, the rooftop and um yeah, and we could build that and then we the nice thing about fme is it can be you can automate the whole thing but then you can also build in confidences. So if there, so if you had some point and and for whatever reason you weren't sure what parcel it belonged to, or maybe there was two points to a parcel, or there was a rooftop that didn't have a point, or things like that, you can capture all those and then put those in a validation report. And so then you would you would be the amount of data you'd have to look at would be much much less than 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 the whole um, you know than the whole thing and your your data the size of thousands or millions is is pretty common now we're seeing um you know data volumes just um explode so yeah so hopefully buffering that's another thing we do um yeah so that's an interesting one love to learn more but hopefully there was something there that was useful but definitely these are the types of problems that um, our customers battle with and we have lots of telco um Customers. Some of them are, you know, using FME to mod, to sort of simulate their cell towers with, you know, how they work and figure out, you know, where all their calls were and what tower it went to for billing or infrastructure or figuring out the last mile. They want to put fiber everywhere because they want to have high speed internet. What's that going to look like? So mm -hmm. lots of things around that, that. Yeah. Awesome. It looks like Carl got back to us and said, uh, the last point about building confidence levels and validation report is what is needed to help him right now. So I think you answered it, Don. Good work. <laughs> oh, wow. Great. Yeah. <laughs> we love this stuff. This is the stuff that Laura and Christian dream about when they go to bed at night is, um, you know, really, um, really heavy duty grinding of spatial, of spatial data. <laughs> no, I do like that uh, question, though, as like a real world example, mm -hmm. and it kind of speaks to Kind of the greater problem i feel like with business intelligence yeah. sometimes is that you're spending so much money collecting data and like on these platforms mm -hmm. and yet your data isn't going in it the way you want it and yeah. that's where we hope that fme can help people out <laughs> that's right and then you could push confidence intervals to your to your tableau or other things so you could look then look on a map and see areas where maybe you know another another thing that telco customers or utility customers use um, FME for is 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 they track happiness of customers, right? And so if you're if you're a utility guy and you're out in the street and you you need to go visit every house because maybe you're putting a new gas line, which means you got to go shut down all the gas, they can they they'll give the they they have an app that shows the the, um, the person in the street how happy the customer is, right? Or does he have an because then if you go to a house and it's green, you know, generally that person's friendly, there's not going to be an issue. But if you go to another house, it's red because the customers had you know, lots of trouble and isn't happy right now, then um, that just prepares the person going to the door so they, they, their, their reaction is better because nobody likes to be surprised by a reaction. And if we know what we're gonna get, then we can be make sure that as the person going to the door, we, we arrive with the right mindset. And so there's lots of ways that you can use location and FME with business intelligence tools to improve your customer's experience. Yeah. Okay, I think then it looks like questions have slowed down. So in the last few minutes here, I'll say get your questions in if you have any others. If not, I think we'll try and end this five minutes early. We have a, a 
the kind of inside policy here at SAFE because we're doing a lot of remote meetings that we like to end them five minutes early and give everyone that little bit of time back in their day. So we'll keep this going if you have questions coming in. If not, we'll wrap it up in the next five minutes. Um, but I guess kind of with that, does anyone have any last comments or questions maybe that came to mind that weren't asked but would be of value to people? I'm putting you guys on the spot. <laughs> No, I'd just say that um, really we see this as a beginning. So um, if you, after the webinar, if you if you think of a question later, um, just reach out to us on live chat or the community. The community is amazing. There's users from all over the world and um, that are just, they live and breathe FME um, or support at safe.com and we'll get, um, get back to you. And if you do find something that you wish FME did and it doesn't, um, that is hugely valuable too. And um, we have an ideas forum on the, in the community too for that, but also reach out to us and, um, and let us know. We have a big team of developers that are working to continually improve and add new capabilities to, uh, to FME. So yeah, and we don't get a chance to talk with people anymore. We used to spend a lot of time on the road, going to conferences. We used to do a world tour that we'd hit like over 70 cities worldwide and we're hoping to get back to that. And so, uh, in the meantime, this is probably as good as it gets, these Ask Me Anythings, which you really enjoy, yeah. yeah. Cool, okay. So anything, I'm trying to think if we have anything exciting upcoming in the BI space that people should watch for when it comes to like webinars or any knowledge articles or anything coming up. We're always putting out new content. <laughs> Well, we have that new one that you're going to be doing, which is for folks who are just new to the geospatial data. It's a, uh, it's targeted at folks who are just, um, you know, encountering geospatial and location data for the first time. And, mm -hmm. and Jeff and Brian um, and I are going to do that one with Steph being Steph's going to be the leader. So there you go. <laughs> I <laughs> am okay. No, that, that sounds good. That will be fun. I think um, that would actually be a really great webinar to watch for. If there's anyone else on your team who is maybe having questions about location data on a higher level, like they don't need to go quite the depth we went into today, this would be a good overview webinar that you could expand to other members of your team if they want to learn a little bit more about it and how they could actually apply it to things like marketing, like what I do. <laughs> So. And there's one on the REST API that's that's all recorded too. Is that one coming up soon or is that one just finished? That's connecting to anything with the REST API. That's a really good one. Um, that's for, coming up. Is it, when is that one? Is it oh next gosh. week? Yeah. Is it next week? It might be. Okay. Or, next week, June 8th, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, wow, looks yeah nice. next Tuesday. There you go. Next Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a favorite of mine because that really shows how FME can connect to anything with a REST API and walks through the process and how to do that. Are you part of that one, Christian? I'm not. Ah, Laura? I Yeah, I am. Okay, yeah, Laura and a few other. Um, so, and that one is, I think, one of our most popular ones. So, mm -hmm. um, this is actually mm -hmm. kind of produced through yeah, popular yeah. demand. <laughs> yeah. And if you do see, if, if there is a some system you need to connect to with a REST API, and but you're not sure how to do it, like just reach out to us. We can help you with that too. Or you know, we could, those are the type of the question because it is easy, but it's like anything. It's easy when you know how to do it, right? Um, and if, you know, riding a bike is easy, but if you've never ridden a bike before, oh boy, it's not easy at all. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard to know where to start sometimes. But once you're into it, it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Well, I think then, why don't we end this a little bit early, but I will leave the re webinar running for another five minutes and we'll be, uh, we'll turn off our webcam, but we'll still be behind the scenes, kind of like a mini live chat for five minutes, even though you could just use our website, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're going to choose us. So feel <laughs> free to type in your questions or save out any of the links that I chatted um, in this next five minutes. And we hope to see you next week then at that REST API webinar. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Thanks, Christian. And staff, thanks always for putting this whole thing together. It's great. Yeah, it was fun. I really appreciate all the questions that came in from the audience today. And having Canner come online with us was so much fun. So a big thanks to everyone who participated. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah. And do, do reach out to us and let us know how we can be better. Yeah. Always. Always. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you guys. See you later.